Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Victoria and in this video we will talk about congenital heart diseases. We have talked about the fetal circulation before, but I will mention again the structures that differentiate the fetal circulation from ours. So there are two structures in the fetal heart that allow the blood to bypass the lungs. These are the foramen ovale that is located between the right and left atrium and there is the ductus arteriosus, it connects the aorta and pulmonary artery. After birth, when the lungs have to function, they close and stop the circulation of the mixed blood. Now the circulation should work, as it does in us adults. When either the ductus arteriosus or the foramen ovale remains open after birth, the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood can still mix as the blood can flow between the left and right chamber of the heart. This is called a shunt. Even though the structures should usually work the same as in the adult heart, there are some differences of a newborn's heart to an adult heart. The myocardium is not as elastic as in an adult and has only around half as many contractile elements as an adult heart. Also in a newborn, the most energy for the myocardium is gained from carbohydrate metabolism. In the adult heart, fatty acids and glucose are mainly used. The newborn's heart has more atrioventricular junctions than ours, and the longitudinal aspect of the His bundle is less homogenic than ours. The heart rate of a newborn baby is usually around 110 to 160 beats per minute while ours is around 70 to 90 beats per minute. Congenital heart diseases are the most common group of birth defects and cause more deaths during the first year of life than any other birth defect. It affects around 8 out of 100 babies. Generally, congenital heart diseases are grouped into two major groups. The first one is the cyanotic type, where less oxygen is in the tissues, leading to a bluish discoloration of the skin and the non-cyanotic type. The severity of the heart defect can range from being an immediate danger to the baby's life to being undetected for many years or decades. Do we know what causes heart defects? Simply said, no. However, there is research that genetics and environmental factors play a role. Around 10 gene mutations have been identified that seem to cause cardiac defects. Also an infection with the rubella virus during the pregnancy or exposure to industrial chemicals or the consumption of alcohol or cocaine increase the risk of developing a cardiac defect. Also medications have been identified that appear to increase the risk for their development. Those include isotretinoin or retinol that is used in creams to treat acne and wrinkles, thalidomide, which is nowadays only approved for a rare, severe skin disorder, and certain anticonvulsive medications. Children that are born with certain chromosomal anomalies, as Down syndrome and Turner syndrome, also have a higher risk of developing a congenital heart defect. Studies show that at least 30% of children with Down syndrome also have a cardiac anomaly. As mentioned earlier, the heart defects can be classified in cyanotic and non-cyanotic. Further, they can also be classified as a heart defect with a left to right shunt, right to left shunt, or without shunt. Now we will talk about some general characteristics of congenital heart disease with left to right shunt. The severity of the shunt depends on the location and between which structures it lies, as well as the size of the defect and the ratio between systemic and pulmonary vascular resistance. When there is increased blood flow to the lungs, it puts more pressure on the pulmonary vessels, leading to the development of pulmonary vascular obstructive disease. In a left to right shunt, there is a change in the vessels leading to an increased vascular resistance, so basically a pulmonary hypertension. The blood has to be pumped against the increase in pressure 
leading to an increase of pressures in the right chamber, which can cause the Eisenmenger syndrome, which permanently damages the blood vessels that go to the lungs and makes them become more narrow and stiffened. When there is prolonged volume overload in the chambers of the heart, the heart structure changes, leading to heart failure. If you want to know more about heart failure in children, you can see the video to that in the playlist as well. Now we will talk about osteum secundum atrial septal defects and osteum primum septal defects. These are both simply said holes in the wall between the atria, which should usually close after birth. The osteum secundum atrial septal defect is located at the edge of the fossa ovalis. The hole can be either round or oval and sometimes fenestrated, which means that there are tissue strands across the opening, but it is not completely closed. This defect makes up around 7% of congenital heart defects and it alone rarely causes heart failure or failure to thrive. The patients often have bluish extremities and in younger infants tachypnea can occur, while the breathing is usually normal in older children. With a stethoscope we can often hear a systolic ejection murmur over the pulmonary trunk, which is located in the second left intercostal space. When the defect is of small to moderate size, it often closes spontaneously, and a surgical closure is usually not necessary. In larger ones, a catheter intervention might be necessary, where a transcatheter device is used to close the defect. Another surgical approach for larger and oval defects is the closure by direct suturing. In rounder defects, a closure by the use of a patch can be done. The patch can be made from Dacron or can be used from the patient's pericardium. The prognosis after the surgery is usually excellent. An osteum primum atrial septal defect is usually located at the most inferior and anterior aspect of the septum. This defect is often associated with trisomy 21. Here there is usually a left to right shunt without a pulmonary vascular disease. This results in volume overload of the right side of the heart and pulmonary overcirculation. Children with smaller defects are usually asymptomatic, especially when there is no concomitant mitral regurgitation. Patients that have a significant pulmonary oversupply of blood are more likely to develop heart failure during infancy. Some patients may also have tachypnea and tachycardia at rest. In patients with this heart defect, the first heart sound is usually normal, while the second heart sound is widely split. A systolic ejection murmur is usually heard the loudest at the upper left sternal border and can be heard over both lungs as well. In patients with larger defects, also a mid-diastolic rumbling sound can be present, which can be heard at the left lower sternal border. The diagnosis is made with a chest x-ray. In patients with a larger left to right shunt, signs of heart failure can be usually seen. Usually cardiomegaly is present, so the cardiothoracic index is over 50%. In an echocardiography, we can usually see the opening between the two atria, which can be visualized by Doppler sonography. In an ECG we can see changes that are caused by the posterior and inferior displacement of the AV node, so there is an abnormality in the conduction system. For the osteum primum defect, a catheter surgery is usually not possible, it has to be repaired by the use of a patch. In the next part we will talk about ventricular septal defects. They can occur either alone or together with other congenital heart defects. The ventricular septal defect occurs in around 2-7% to of infants. The defect can be classified according to which part of the ventricular tissue they involve. They can be either perimembranous or muscular and can then be subdivided into which location they affect. These defects make it possible for blood of the systemic and pulmonary circulation to mix 
and the clinical presentation depends largely on the size of the defect and how much of the blood mixes. A left to right shunt is the consequence and it leads to an increased left ventricle volume load, excessive pulmonary blood flow and a reduced systemic cardiac output. Small defects are usually asymptomatic. In infants with a moderately sized defect, often excessive sweating can be observed, especially during feeding. Also, increased fatigue can be usually seen in feeding. Infants are often not growing properly and due to the pulmonary congestion, respiratory infections occur more frequently. With moderate and large defects, patients usually present also with signs of heart failure, cardiomegaly and a holosystolic murmur that is poorly localized and accompanied by a diastolic rumble. The Eisenmenger complex is also in this defect a possible consequence. The permanent pulmonary hypertension leads to the left to right shunt developing into a right to left shunt. A secondary aortic insufficiency develops sometimes. In a chest x-ray, we can often see an increased cardiac silhouette and increased pulmonary vascular markings with a more prominent pulmonary artery. The left atrium is often enlarged. In an echocardiography, we can visualize the defect and with the Doppler sonography, we can see how the blood mixes. In patients with a small defect, the ECG is usually normal. In moderate to large defects, changes will be seen, as they usually present with a left ventricular hypertrophy. The therapy usually concentrates on the management of the heart failure, and in infants with larger defects, usually a higher caloric intake is necessary, sometimes by supplementation of parenteral nutrition. Diuretics are usually used to reduce the pulmonary congestion. ACE inhibitors can be used to decrease the systemic and pulmonary blood pressure. As the defect is close to the aortic valve, in a surgical therapy it has to be paid special attention to not damage the valve. Muscular ventricular defects are often closed with a transcatheter approach, but perimembranous defects are difficult to close percutaneously. The current recommendation is to close the defect by using a cardiopulmonary bypass. Now we will talk about atrioventricular septal defects. These are holes between the atrium and the ventricle, where usually also the valve is malformed or does not work properly. These defects make up around 2 to 9% of congenital heart defects. The defect can be a primum atrial septal defect and cleft mitral valve, or a defect of both the primum atrial septum and inlet ventricular septum with the presence of a common atrioventricular valve. Patients that have only a little atrioventricular valve regurgitation and high pulmonary vascular resistance are often asymptomatic in childhood. The defect might be discovered in their 20s or 30s. At this time they usually develop cyanosis from advanced pulmonary vascular disease. Other signs might be tachypnea, recurrent respiratory tract infections and in more severe cases with early onset of symptoms also poor feeding and failure to thrive. The pulmonary vascular disease usually results from damage to the pulmonary blood vessels caused by the increased blood flow to the lungs and higher pressure in the vessels. The volume and pressure overload in the right ventricle usually leads to a murmur being heard over the left sternal border and subxiphoid area. The first heart sound is usually normal, but the second heart sound is narrowly split with a pulmonary component. Also a crescendo-decrescendo murmur can be heard at the upper left sternal border. This is due to the increased blood flow through the pulmonary valve. The atrioventricular valve is usually damaged, leading to a holosystolic murmur at the apex of the heart. This sound is due to blood flowing back to the atria. In many patients also signs of heart failure are seen.
A chest X-ray usually shows enlargement of the heart silhouette, and in the echocardiography, the defect can be seen in the atrial and ventricular septum. In the ECG, the PR interval may be longer due to the atrial enlargement and therefore the atrial conduction time being longer, as the signal has to travel a further distance through the atrium. Usually a surgery is done in the first six months of life to prevent a pulmonary veno-occlusive disease. The repair is usually by a patch surgery where the defect in the wall is closed. Also an antibiotic prophylaxis is recommended for six months after the repair of the defect for patients who have a residual intracardiac shunt and have undergone a patch repair surgery. Now we will talk about the patent ductus arteriosus. So when the ductus arteriosus does not close after birth. It should usually close within the first 15 hours after birth by contraction of the muscular wall. This is usually initiated by the increase in partial pressure of oxygen and by the lack of prostaglandins that were provided by the placenta. The lungs that are now active are also metabolizing the prostaglandins that are circulating in the infant's blood. Factors that can prevent the closure of the ductus arteriosus are high levels of prostaglandins, hypoxemia and nitric oxide production. All those relax the muscular wall of the ductus arteriosus. Factors leading to contraction of the muscular wall and so closure of the ductus include lower levels of prostaglandins, higher partial pressure of oxygen, increased endothelin-1, norepinephrine, acetylcholine and bradykinin. In a patent ductus arteriosus, there is a communication between the descending thoracic aorta and the pulmonary artery. It is one of the most common congenital heart defects. Depending on how big the defect is, and how high the pulmonary resistance is, the symptoms will be different. After three months, when the ductus arteriosus is still open, it is considered to be abnormal. A patent ductus arteriosus leads to a left to right shunt, so blood from the systemic circulation mixes with the blood from the pulmonary circulation, leading to more blood flowing towards the lungs, leading to decreased pulmonary compliance. Usually patients are asymptomatic. Some may experience exercise intolerance or pulmonary congestion and a cardiac murmur that can be heard with a stethoscope. Some patients can also present with tachypnea, difficulty of feeding and weight loss or failure to thrive. In larger defects, patients present with a hoarse cry, cough, lower respiratory tract infections atelectasis or pneumonia. With the stethoscope a murmur can usually be found, which is systolic rather than continuous and has a machine-like sound quality to it. The murmur is usually loudest at the left upper quadrant of the child's chest. Sometimes the murmur is the only finding. It can also be visualized in an echocardiography with Doppler sonography. The spontaneous closure of the patent ductus arteriosus is common. Intravenous medications as indometacin or ibuprofen are used to initiate the closure if it is given in the first two weeks of life. If this is ineffective, a cardiac catheterization can be done. It can be done during the first few months of life in patients with an isolated patent ductus arteriosus. In larger openings, a surgical ligation is the treatment of choice. The surgical results are usually the best if the surgery was done during the first three years of life, as later on pulmonary hypertension and increased pulmonary vascular resistance can develop. Around two to three weeks after the surgery, a follow-up echocardiography is recommended to check if the ductus remained closed. In rare cases, the ductus opened again after a surgery. In the last part, I want to talk about Tetralogy of Fallot. It is a combination of four defects that occur together. The Tetralogy 
consists of a ventricular septal defect, pulmonary stenosis, overriding of the aorta, and a right ventricular hypertrophy. It makes up around 11% of congenital heart defects and is the most commonly occurring cyanotic heart defect. It is due to a developmental defect of the septum aortico pulmonale, which usually separates the right and left parts of the vessels that lead the blood out of the heart, the aorta and pulmonary artery. The leading symptoms are louder heart sounds and cyanosis. Often there is also an increase in hematocrit. Some complications include dyspnea, loss of consciousness and recurring syncopies. In an x-ray we can see a right ventricular hypertrophy and an abnormality in the great arteries of the heart. The cardiothoracic index is often normal. The treatment is usually surgical and depends on the extent of the defect. The surgery consists of closing of the ventricular septal defect and a reconstruction of the great arteries. The surgery is usually done between the 4th and 12th month of life. Without the treatment, the 10-year survival rate is around 30%, but with treatment, the prognosis is much better. That's it for this video. It was rather long, but hopefully helpful, and if you like our channel, please subscribe. Thank you for watching and hopefully see you again in the next video.